How are you? I'm great. How are you? Well, welcome. Nice to see you. How's life? Life is good. Thanks for doing the show. Thanks for asking. Long day for you. Long day. Dinner. Starts at, well, quarter to five in the morning. That's the wake-up call. That's the, 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 the alarm clock. And so how many times do you hit snooze before you actually get out? I get right out of bed. I just jump. I have another right alarm in another room. But no, I'm, sometimes I wake up before it. Was it a huge adjustment for you intellectually and emotionally when you went from the field to a more stable, you know where you are, job? It was different in the sense that I um, suddenly, I, I was on all the time. Like, my questions, when you're a reporter, your questions, you take little clips. People don't know that you ask ten stupid questions first. And So when, when somebody can follow the, the sort of the trajectory of the story through your questions, right. you have to be more on with let's, the questions. Let's go to the beginning of the trajectory, or at least early in the trajectory, okay? Take a look at this. Christmas is the season of parcels. 6,000 a day out of this Fredericton Post Office alone. Most of these are headed to points west. And because they're already here, they'll get where they're going in time to make it under the Christmas tree. Anna Maria Tremonti, CBC News, Fredericton. I don't remember that. That's moving. I don't remember that. Post Office 1982. That's the time it was. Yeah. And I was thinking about it in the context of telling and choosing stories and telling and knowing what to choose, because that's the real dilemma that people have. Let's go early days of journalism. Take a look at this. He's hammering highly explosive TNT out of an unexploded Serbian artillery shell. It will be used in a variety of grenades for the Bosnian Muslim army. The Bosnians insisted on blindfolding us to keep the location secret. This is a factory where they improvise. The same machines they used to turn the tops of this armor-piercing grenade used to be used to make coffee pots for Turkish coffee in Sarajevo. What do you remember from that story? I remember being blindfolded yeah. and wondering where am I going. Um, I liked that story. That TNT he was hammering, by the way, it could have just exploded. Right. We thought about that later. After, you didn't think about it? Come on, you must have thought about it before. Uh, it no, no, we, we were busy. We didn't think about it. You noticed I had the flak jacket on, though. I yeah. loved that flak jacket. I wore it all the time. So it's, it's not like some people don't want to wear it. They think it's too heavy. Was it a security You know, a, a couple of things, and even practical things in television, you don't have to worry about your shirts being wrinkled. All right. they can see is this. <laughs> but it was a good flak jacket. It had big plates that actually would repel stuff. Uh, fortunately, I never had to test it. It's incredible what your mind does to get you to a place to be okay with it. Like many people would say, the fact that you even had to think of the size of the plates is an indicator that you shouldn't be there. Yep, you know, um, I used to, once I asked my mother to pack my flak jacket for me, I was in Jerusalem and I was going to Lebanon and she said, you tell me not to worry and you tell me to pass your, you know, pack your flak jacket. And I'd say, mom, if I didn't ask you to pack it, then you should worry. How did you deal with the, the, the stories you've covered over the years, especially the ones that have real human hardship in them that stay with you? How did you deal with those? Mm, well, sometimes people stay with me for a very long time. Sometimes um, I would write it out, you know, I write their story out and I sort of get through it. But I'll tell you, sometimes on The Current, I'll do a story with somebody and, and they're talking about a trauma they've gone through and we're pre-taping it. We don't do it live because we want to give them the space. And I'll talk to them, say, at 10 o'clock in the morning. And 6 o'clock at night, I'm feeling really awful. And I realize the reason I am is because I've, I've absorbed their story. And I'm still thinking about it. So sometimes I just absorb it. When you were younger, was this part of your plan? Like, were you into storytelling in your family? Uh, yes and no. I wanted to be a playwright. I thought journalists were writers who couldn't get work. Right. <laughs> when did that change? <laughs> when when I got work. <laughs> <laughs> when you wanted to make rent, did that what happened? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I sort of fell into it. I got interested in university, joined my student newspaper, and, and then I just had the bug. Th that early job... How would you describe your early bosses? And Because you were the first woman on the air at your station, weren't you? I was, I was, and they told me that if I hadn't worked out, they wouldn't have hired another woman. Right. Did you believe them? Was that, was that like a lot of pressure to carry? Uh, well, they told me after. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, remember, I remember starting as a news gopher at, at CKLW in Windsor, which at the time was the big station in the United States, yeah. um, Motown, you know. And um, I, they, they had only one woman on the air, and she sounded just like a guy. And I went, huh, interesting. You know, but as time went on, more and more women. By the time I went to Sarajevo, there were a lot of women covering war. It was about the time when bosses got, they got it, like, oh, hang on, we better send the women as well. How do you manage those first few nights when you had to go to sleep? Because that's at one moment, especially if you're like to be in, in any control at all, 
those moments when you know you have to fall asleep in a war zone, you don't have any control. Well, you know, we were staying, when we first got to Sarajevo, we stayed at the Holiday Inn, which was all bombed out in the front. And I don't know if you remember, I used to work as a waitress in the Holiday Inn in Windsor, Ontario. Well, I don't remember that part. No, but, yeah, but, yeah. but the, <laughs> I mean, the, uh, the, and, and the slogan was, the best surprise is no surprise. So there I was in the Holiday Inn in Sarajevo where there were bullet holes in my room. And my window had a satellite phone in it so that we could call out. And the first night, there was all sorts of ordnance going by the window. You could hear bullets whizzing by. You could hear things. And I thought, this isn't safe. I'm going to sleep in the hallway. Right. So I got my flak jacket and I got my pillow and my sleeping bag and I went in the hallway. But the hallway was an atrium with plate glass. And I thought, oh, you know, plate glass. You've seen the movies where glass goes flying. So I thought, not good. So I went back into the room and I thought, I'll go in the bathroom because, you know, I have a little bit of protection. You can sleep in the tub. Yeah, or you could just sleep on the floor, you know. So I was doing that and I was sleeping on the, I put my sleeping bag out on the floor and I'm sort of, my head is sort of not far from where the toilet is. And I'm looking and I, the sink is on the wall that faces into the room. And I think, oh, if there's a blast, that sink's going to come flying at me. And I'll be killed by a sink that is so embarrassing. And I thought, I thought, oh, to hell with it. And I went back to bed. And I never worried about it again. What kind of server were you? Were you a quality server at the, at the Holiday Inn? Uh, I was okay. Yes. I was okay. I can still hold four glasses in one hand. Well, you still can? Oh, yeah. Party trick? Yeah. <laughs> well, I heard a story that one of your bosses said you had to have sex with them to get your job. Is that accurate? Oh, that was, yeah, that was. That was, I was really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately... <laughs> He told me I was no that I was really young and it was my second job. Like, and like illegal young? No, I was okay. I, no I was I was twenty one. Right, I was twenty one and it was my second job and he told me I was lousy on air and that he could help me, but he'd need something in return. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I I was stunned. I didn't know what to do. So uh, he had said, Come for a drink, let's talk about your work and I thought, Okay. And I was stunned and I left the bar and he followed me and he said do you have a television can i come over and watch hockey like he actually asked me that but were the leafs on, on? The next... is that the... <laughs> and it was a wednesday i remember this because i had thursday friday off and i didn't know what to do and i was working saturday to wednesday and when i showed up saturday he had been fired not because of me but by a fluke he had been fired and he's he died like not long after he had many problems but um <laughs> and i did not kill him huh? <laughs> <laughs> Stick around more with Anna Maria right after this. She asks questions for a living. I ask questions for a living. Coming up, a question face off with Anna Maria Tremonti next. Are you ready? Fight! on the program, Anna Maria Tremonti here from The Current and CBC. So much stuff covered in your career. Your time in the Middle East is interesting because for, for many people, no matter how you cover the story, there are organized campaigns on both sides that will just come after you. So much so that there's a chill for most people even just talking about it. Mm -hmm. you got tons of great letters. Dear Mrs. Tremonti, it's been brought to your attention that during your interview with Henry Kissinger, you suggested that American troops in Iraq and Kissinger himself could be prosecuted by war crimes. It's a form letter, da 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 And then handwritten at the end, you are a communist slut, which is written at the end. That's right. And as I say, George, I'm not a communist. Out <laughs> of girl. Out of girl. All right. So... After your interview with Colin Mocker, you did this thing where you, you're very accomplished at improv, and I don't know if people knew that about you or not, but you did the alphabet game, right, where somebody would say something, starts with the letter A, and then B, and then back and forth uh -huh. and back and forth. So uh -huh. I want to play something similar to that with you. Because you're an exceptional interviewer, you're great at asking questions, and from time to time, I have been known to ask questions myself. <laughs> I'm not on your level, but I ask questions for a living. How far can we have a conversation where we never really answer each other, we just ask questions? So essentially, we're do I like. Have to? I mean, you, do you have a good reason why you wouldn't? What do you think? <laughs> I think only you know the answer to that. Do you? Do I? I think history would suggest, unless the history written about you is wrong, is it? History can be incorrect. It really depends on your point of view. What's yours? I think my point of view is I like to take in information from all places, including yours. How do you weigh in on it? I try not to weigh in on a lot of things, and I wonder if you think that that is wise. How's that working out for you? How do you think it's working out for me? What do you mean by that? 
Could you clarify? <laughs> I think I've been pretty clear, don't you? But you know, even as you ask me that, I'm wondering what your motivation is. I think, I think I spend a lot of my time wondering the same thing about you. Is that a question? <laughs> I think you win. Anna Maria Gironde, everybody. The show is called The Current. It's Week Dead in the Studio on TV2 Radio 1. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.